in that video. Uh, no audio. So, good morning, everyone. I just have to give a disclaimer that, uh, in you know, in statistics, you have an outlier. I'm a kind of an outlier because I don't come from the industry, and I'm also an accidental person in the diagnostic field. So, I'll talk a little bit about the work that we do in the lab, and uh, you know, some applications of it, uh, which also went into diagnostics. So the focus of this uh, today's talk is uh, is on uh, the basic technology or let's say the basic platform that we employ um, in our lab, which is uh, based on CRISPR, the the genome editing tool. I think almost uh, everybody is now aware of CRISPR in some form in your uh, in your work, and uh, how one can use that uh, with precision to read and write the genome. So. This is a, an image from 2016 uh, in the Rajiv Chowk metro station in, in Delhi. I would have been happy to say that this was in 2016 because it's still the same in 2022 after the pandemic. But uh, that's how it is. Uh, and you have a single train and you have so many people who are trying to get into board. And uh, sometimes you just simply get moved into the, the train and sometimes you just simply move out. And I'm sure this happens in the local trains in Bombay as well. So what happens is that you know it's very different from how the metro service works in a lot of other countries where there might be a line and, and all these things. But that uh, luxury is, is not possible because our problems are different. And therefore, when you have different problems, you need different types of solutions. Sometimes you can put the people outside the train and they can still travel, like you see over here. Or you find more innovations. The, the moot point is that you know what works in a different setting, in a different context, in a different problem, might not actually work in the same way in the problem that you want to address. And I think CRISPR has taught that in many ways. Um, you know, the fundamental aspect where CRISPR is used is, of course, to correct a gene. But how this correction happens, or what happens upon the correction, or whether you can actually use the property that it can sit on the DNA and do something else can be applied for several other things, including diagnostics, is what innovation has, has come up with. Uh, so why uh, genome editing? I think it's a trillion dollar economy, lots of uh, startups in, in all over the world, a lot of big companies actually, diseases getting cured. And while I talk, we have uh, within us, in, in not, not here maybe, but, but somewhere in the world, there are patients who have actually been cured of their diseases. That's a big statement to make when we say cured of a disease. Because, you know, if you have a genetic disease and you correct that mutation and you follow that person for a couple of years and you do not have any remnant of the disease, that's a very promising thing to say as far as going towards the cure. So that's the power of this technology, that you can potentially get rid of a mutation which you had inherited. And, you know, 20 years back, if somebody would have told that you could actually change the DNA that you are born with in some way and you can remove mutations, bring in something beneficial, Nobody would have believed it, but that's uh, kind of the power of genome editing. Ex vivo trials have happened, and very recently, even in vivo, where people have been given a shot of CRISPR, let's say, uh, which goes into the, the bloodstream, goes into the liver, corrects a mutation, and the patient is cured from a, from a, from a disease. Of course, uh, you know, it's still early days. Like in any kind of uh, therapy, you need to follow up people for a long period of time to see what are the effects that can have. But you know, when, when there are patients who are waiting on the line with multiple diseases, with the lease of life for a one year or a two year or three year from, you know, to, to extend their lifespan, this is a very valuable technology. It works on the principle that you have a have a you know protein which is obtained from bacteria. Bacteria, of course, are very smart. They used it to ward off their uh, their invaders, which are viruses. And this protein is called it's it's uh, in the most rudimentary form is called a Cas protein. Cas nine shown over here, and you see that this Cas protein with a with a, with this blue RNA, which is called a guide RNA, you can program it to go and sit on any target DNA sequence. It opens up the DNA, it opens up the double helix, the RNA moves through it, makes a base pair uh, with the target DNA, and then it can actually. Uh, 
make the Cas9 active and it cuts the DNA uh, at that precise point where it sits. And the cellular repair machinery then takes over. Sometimes it does a good job where it makes a perfect you know, correction. Sometimes it makes indels that gives rise to knockouts. But as a clinician, if you then provide a small piece of DNA, which is, let's say, a corrected form of a mutation that was already present over there, you can incorporate that. That gets recorded into the DNA, the cell divides, the information is stored, and essentially you have gotten rid of a mutation. So that's the, that's the aspect of, of uh, gene editing which leads to correction. That's all very good, but uh, you know, <coughs> several of us here have done a PCR at some point of time. And you know that this whole process begins with that RNA binding to DNA. That's about 20 nucleo nucleotides length, you know, 20 bases or so, 22 bases perhaps. And if you have done a PCR reaction and you have designed your primers, you have taken, put a lot of thought into it, and then you run the gel, and then you see instead of having that band, or in addition to having that band, you have a lot of other things on the gel. And that's because the binding of two nucleotide sequences is very complex, and it's not always 100% dependent upon just the homology. So that's why we have what is called it as an off-target. The same thing happens with CRISPR. You have your guide RNA, which is supposed to go and bind to those 20 bases of BRCA1, let's say, but maybe 15 of those bases are also similarly found somewhere else in the genome, let's say in the P53 gene, and then you go and sit on the P53 and cut it. That's dangerous, and that's why CRISPR also leads to what is known as off-targeting across the genome. And this off-targeting happens because the CAS by itself is intrinsically not 100% specific. And uh, just show, to tell you how fast this whole thing happens, this is a video taken by Atomic Force Microscopy from a pre uh, group in, in Japan who later on became our collaborators. That's a single cast protein sitting on a DNA. And you, it, will, it will show you that within 32 seconds, it actually cuts the DNA. So that's, that's all that is required. Inside a cell, CAS sitting on DNA, 32 seconds, it cuts the DNA. You're flooding a system with CAS, let's say, and you have it going and sitting to different parts of the genome. If there is a mistake, you can also create these kind of breaks elsewhere. And that is why it's so important to build or actually improve the system to make it more and more specific. And uh, many people have been doing this over over uh, you know over time since cas9 came uh, including us as well and and generally what happens is that you take a template crispr which in this case is a streptococcus pyogenes cas9 shown right at the top and then you do protein engineering you try to make it more specific you reduce the contacts that you make with non specific bases by engineering the protein and as you keep on doing that something interesting happens your activity falls down and that's what you see over there so the the more specific this thing becomes the activity goes down and your efficiency of correction also goes down so you have to find a kind of a sweet spot somewhere in between and take this and these are the ones that went into trial and, and so on, and uh, you try to see that you can correct the disease with that. So I would like to keep, uh, you know, uh, keep that in mind, that you know, there is this inverse relationship between activity and specificity. So to cut a long story short, in 2019, we reported a CAS, which uh, was again is an orthogonal CAS9, and at that point of time, this CAS was, not, was studied a lot because it happened to be one of the biggest CAS proteins. And in the field, in the CRISPR field, people are always going for the smaller and smaller and smaller proteins because it's easy to deliver, okay? But this Cas protein from Francisilla novicida is a type 2B Cas uh, protein. And what we found out in this particular uh, study is that it had a very remarkable specificity to even point mismatches. So if you take a test tube, you put in a DNA, and you put in a DNA with mismatches in it, and you cut that DNA with these two different Cas's, the Streptococcus pyogenes versus the FN Cas9, you see that the FN Cas9 is not able to cleave whenever there is a mismatch. And that tells you that intrinsically this protein has a lot of uh, very high specificity. Of course, most of this work that I'm going to show you today is done with my, my close colleague, collaborator, and, uh, and uh, friend, uh, Dr. Shobik Maiti. But what we, what we then decided to see is that, well, you know, if it has that specificity, can this now be taken forward for, let's say, a clinical application where you correct a disease-causing mutation? We were fortunate to be funded by, by CSR for, for quite some time now for the sickle cell anemia mission, where the, the, the idea is that can you bring some of these therapies for the sickle cell patients in India, which happens to be a tribal disease, mostly in the tribal belts, the poorest of the poor, 
And uh, it's also one of the first diseases to be corrected by CRISPR in the world. Uh, the reason being that you can correct this ex vivo, okay? I'll to talk about that in details maybe at, uh, after the talk if you have questions. But just to, to suffice to say that when we tested this Cas9 on the same sickle cell target region, which is the hemoglobin B, where the mutation happens, what we saw is that compared to this uh, Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9, our efficiency of editing was very low. And that was not good enough for you know, clinical application. So, of course, it was very specific. There was no off-target activity, but we needed a kind of a magic number, and that magic number is around 30%, which is considered in the, in the, in the field, to be able to say that you know, this would be clinically feasible to take this forward. So if we had to use FNCAS9 for this work, we would need two things. One, we needed a higher efficiency variant, which would be able to take up this editing efficiency up. But more importantly, we should not be losing the specificity. Okay? So the problem, as you see, is a bit different from the Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9 problem, where the, speci the, uh, the efficiency was already very high, and you try to increase the specificity or reduce the efficiency. Here, we had a high specificity protein, and we are trying to increase this efficiency. And went back to the drawing, you know, the, 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 the blackboard and tried to figure out from basic principles what would be needed in order to make a protein bind stronger to, stronger to DNA. And uh, of course, it's affinity, right? The affinity to the bases, that has to be changed. Won't go into too many details again, but what we did is a very, very, uh, you know, how to say, determined postdoc who went and worked with Professor Osamu Nureki, who, so, who actually solved the crystal structure of uh, Cas9 in the first place in Tokyo. And he made close to 50 different versions of this FN Cas9, all by point mutations, purified all of them, tested all of them, and found out that we can come up with certain Cas proteins, which we now call as engineered FN Cas9 proteins, which are way higher in terms of activity, uh, the, uh, the kinetics, the protein kinetics, as compared to the wild type FN Cas9, which is shown here in black. And most importantly, when you put them inside the cells, and you look at the locus where we had an earlier about 20, 20, 10 to 20% activity, we can shoot that up all the way up to 50, 60% without any loss in specificity. And this can be done also with, uh, in different types of cells. Our collaborators at LV Prasad who are using these proteins for, for iPSCs, for example, they are doing this for editing. And there too, we see a much higher level of activity at the iPSCs in terms of editing, or in ARPE cells, or in a host of other cells that different people are now using this. But very importantly, even inside the cell, and that's the, the, the bottom graph that is going to show you, is that it has got this point mismatch specificity. You know, if you take a s target and you have another genomic target which is different by a single mismatch, this gas is actually not even binding to that single mismatch substrate. Whereas, if you take some of these high fidelity engineered versions of Streptococcus pyogenes, they are editing these almost at the same level as the wild type. So the specificity is retained. Now that was all very good, and I'll come back to that in a second. Something interesting that we observed was that here we are talking about DNA protein binding. If you take Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9, or you take the high fidelity versions of it which are specific, it doesn't mean that this, this high specificity is because it is unable to recognize these mismatched substrates anymore. It still recognizes them. That's why you see the binding affinity is pretty similar between a target and an off-target. Whereas if you have the FNCAS9 or the engineered FNCAS9, the, there is a tremendous shift in the binding affinity the moment you have a mismatch. And that's, we do not know why that is. We are solving the crystal structure with, uh, with the researchers at Texas. Uh, why it determines this high specificity. But we immediately uh, kind of uh, got an idea that perhaps we could use this to read the genome with high specificity. Because it's a protein DNA binding, right? And that's where actually Feluda came, and that's probably why I've been called here. Uh, Feluda is, is, of course, where we use all this basic knowledge in the lab to see if you can make this into a diagnostic, where you have a protein recognizing DNA with very high specificity and not recognizing another DNA which is different by a single mismatch. And that's basically a single nucleotide variant, SNV. And that's there in almost all Mendelian disorders that we talk about. Uh, the name, of course, when you have Bengalis in the group, uh, was, was, uh, uh, came from, from the, the, the iconic character from Satyajit Ray. And the reason why we gave it uh, Feluda was because 
Two other groups from MIT, uh, uh, Feng Zhang and Jennifer Doudna, who was the Nobel Prize winner from, from uh, Berkeley, came up with their own CRISPR technologies for detection based on CAS-12 and CAS-13, and they called it Sherlock and Detector. So, you know, we thought a homegrown name would be better, and that's why Feluda, F is there, na? so F and CAS is very easy to, my wife suggested this name, she's a Punjabi. So, she knows the, 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 the emotions that we have with, with Ray. And, uh, and the principle is that you have this Cas protein which can sit on the DNA and will not be reacting or let's say binding to the DNA when there is a mismatch. And then you use that as a signal readout basically in different forms and how, how you want to use it either through a gel electrophoresis or a strip or, or fluorescence and so on. And the initial purpose of this was actually for sickle cell. So we were in the, in the fields and we saw that the, the traditional ways of doing sickle cell testing still, and just came back from a camp in Raipur in Chhattisgarh, is still the solubility test. You know, it's a very crude test, most of the time misses. And uh, you know, you have these kids who are lined up there uh, in, the, in, the, in the primary healthcare center. And some of them, like the one who doesn't have, have the slippers, is not very excited at the prospect of having the finger pricked with, for a few ml of blood. So we asked them to, to basically spit into a small tube. It's genomic DNA, so it's there in saliva as, is, as it is in blood, okay? And then you do a PCR, uh, which could be an isothermal PCR, all done at a point of care. And then you can use a paper strip to detect the sickle cell anemia mutation on a paper strip. The whole process takes about one hour, one and a half hours to complete. And of course this, you know, it lyses the cells and the DNA is out. But then while we were working on this, the pandemic came. So we had to shift focus, all funding stopped for other things. You know, you have to work on COVID pandemic. And so we thought that if you know it can detect the sickle cell, which is one mismatch, it can of course just detect something with 20 matches, which is the, the COVID thing. So we converted that into a, uh, into a paper strip where you use uh, the, the, the chemistry of a standard uh, kind of, uh, almost like a pregnancy strip, basically nanoparticles. We converted the CAS into a FAM labeled one, moved it nanoparticle accumulation, I think won't go into details. But suffice to say that there will be a line if there is a, ba if, if there is a band, it tells you that it's a, it's a positive reaction. If there is none, then you do not have that. And uh, we collaborated with people, one of them sitting over here, right here, Bala. Uh, he came up with the idea that you, you could, we could convert this into a, into a phone to read this strip. Because as we were testing this in the, in, the, in, the, in the field, sometimes the operator would come and say, is this a faint band? Is it a you know, strong band? And so on. So a machine language based app, which is called Topshe. Uh, again, you know, we went into a naming spree. Topshe, of course, is true outcome predicted via strip evaluation, which takes a picture tells you if whether this is a positive signal and so on. And then if Topshe and Feluda are there, Jatayu has to come. It's a sacrilege if you don't have that, right? So Jatayu is, of course, the web server, which is a junction for the target design and analysis of your Feluda assay. I'll come more on Jatayu, what happens. It's basically you can put in your sequence of interest, and the Feluda assay will be completely designed with the primers, sequences, CAS, everything. Uh, this went to the, the Tatas. The Tata took this ahead. Um, they made it into a kind of an end-to-end -end robotic platform, which they called as Tata MD Check, uh, where you know you could multiplex this in multiple forms, and uh, you know these are things that they did during the pandemic. The virus evolved, and as the virus evolves, it has mutations. We are right now in. Uh, I don't know what is the version. I have to look up Anurag's tweets to see what is the current version. I think X, Y, Z, A, B, C, whatever it is. And you have these mutations which are which are continuously accumulating. Okay, and. Uh, Traditionally, if you use qPCR to detect them, it's not a very accurate method. Had it been, then qPCR would have been used for variant diagnosis a long time back. So it's still uh, not very, very accurate when you want to say whether you have an Omicron variant or whether you have a Delta variant, etc. And, uh, and otherwise, the gold standard is, of course, sequencing. You do large-scale sequencing that takes time, effort, money, everything. But like I said, that you know, the principle of Feluda is that you can detect a buoyant mismatch using the specificity of this enzyme sitting on the DNA. And that's what we convert it into, which is, again, no uh, you know, marks for guessing the name called Ray, uh, which is rapid variant assay. And this essentially uses this discriminating power of CAS to tell whether there is a point mismatch using a couple of strips now. So if you have both of them positive, then you have, let's say, the Omicron variant and a COVID positive. If you one of them, then you are COVID positive, but let's say not uh, the other one. There are some limitations because how many strips would you want to have, you know, if you want to take this for large X, Y, Z. So we are working on multiple things uh, with different people to see how we can uh, consolidate that even more. But it takes way lo lower time than how your 
standard sequencing reactions take it's just about a, a couple of hours maybe. And this is all now put in the form of Chris Sniper, which is the second version of Jatayu, where you can put in your CAS. Now it's not just FN CAS9, CAS12, CAS13, whatever CAS that you want to put in, and you can get a readout. Uh, what is your guide RNA design? What are your primers, etc.? All this comes in. But we still have a disease to cure. We went all into COVID, right? We were started with sickle cell anemia. Problem with you know curing diseases uh, with whatever new technology is that there are multiple angles to it. It's not just the basic science. It's not just the patient's advocacy. But you also need the government, the funders, the regulators, and everybody else on board. And it's a mammoth, mammoth, mammoth task, believe me, along with the, co the fact that it is costly. So we have been very lucky, I would say, because we have just been funded uh, to take this ahead into a trial. And uh, you know, sickle cell is a, is a disease of the poor. It's from the tribal belts. Maharashtra is also one of these belts, actually. And the typical sickle cell ex vivo trial costs about one, one million US dollars at this point of time for CRISPR in the US. And uh, bone marrow transplantation basically costs about 10 to 12 lakhs. And these are tribal people. They'll not be able to actually afford this unless there is a government support, subsidi subsidies, and so on. So we need to find out ways which are frugal, innovative solutions. One such way is that instead of having the patient come to, let's say, AIMS, where we are going to do this trial in, in maybe two, three years, once everything is done, um, is to possibly bring the therapy to the people. And for that, we need to come up with ideas where you can post potentially give something to the patient as a drip. Can you package them in right vectors that goes to the right cells, does the editing, and it's still safe, and it corrects the disease? That's what the plan is. So while the ex vivo is, of course, what we are looking forward to, where we are, you know, we are going into preclinicals now, we take the cells out of the patient, correct it in a cell manufacturing place, bring it back, similar to CAR-T, let's say. But what, what is a dream, let's say, is, is to see if you can bring these therapies to the, to the people that reduces the cost. And there are advantages of that, of course, is that it's a one-time correction. You correct the disease, you know, one the mutation, it basically gets corrected. Uh, BMT-associated complications are also, also not there, and of course, the scalability. But for that, you need a CRISPR system to enter and just sit on the DNA and correct it. Now, that's complicated because I told you something about repair, right, in the beginning, where the DNA has to be broken, a template has to be there. How do you deliver all these things? So thanks to David Liu, I was talking to, to, to Dr. Abdul just now, he mentioned David Liu. Uh, we have something which is called a base editor, which can do all this without the need for breaking the DNA. Now we have our engineered FNCAS9 base editor, which actually, uh, I'm very happy to say, works very nicely actually on the, on, the, on, the, on the DNA. The chemistry is that it sits on the DNA, and then it converts an adeno, adenine to inosine, okay? Just because the CAS is now fused to a domain which is an adenosine deaminase. And this inosine is in the next round recognized as a, as a G, and then the AT to GC conversion takes place by the cell's own machinery. This has already uh, gone, is, is going into trials in the US, and we hope to take this forward ahead for our uh, trial as well. And its efficiency as well as specificity is very, very high. Uh, we need the vectors, so we have teamed up with some very, very good people, Orko at uh, Nara Netrale, who is making these AAVs where he's packaging the, the gas proteins. Um, Dr. Manisha's group, and I think Dr. Umair is here, uh, I saw in the morning, so they are helping us with probably going to do the, the immunoprofiling of these cells. And uh, Dr. Rajkumar at IICT, and Drew Wiseman, who has been a very, you know, uh, godsend in this particular thing, who actually expressed interest and came up with this. He, of course, is the, is the father of the Moderna vaccines, as you might know, the mRNA technology. He is going to make or help us make these LNPs, which will package these uh, mRNAs uh, for delivery. So this is the last slide. Uh, you know, I just try to emphasize that our problems are very unique, and our problems require solutions that have to come from here. And that's, I think, the motto of this whole, 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 uh, uh, how to say, session. And uh, it requires commitment at different levels, not just at the level of funding, but also at the level of regulators, the patients whom we are going to treat, and most importantly, the public ecosystem, that who, who is actually looking at this. Because the queue is long. Every month, there is a mail that I get from parents who want their disease uh, kid to get a new lease of life. And these are rarest of rare disorders, uh, you know, where just a mutation correction could potentially give rise to a cure. 
uh, and most importantly, resource sharing. So, you know, all these plasmids, constructs that I've talked to you today about is there in AdGene. Uh, but of course, you don't have to get it from AdGene. You just simply write a mail to me. I would be happy to share them all with you. And uh, yeah, this is the most important slide. Of course, it's a big team, a lot of people involved. We have been generously funded. And I'm actually hiring. So if there are people who are interested in getting into this kind of work, translational um, work with CRISPR and some other interesting things, please feel free to write to me. Thank you very much, and I would be happy to take questions. So if you have a question, just raise your hands. We have volunteers who will bring the mic to you. Thank you very much. That was a, a lovely talk. Um, now, sickle cell disease, I, I'm a physician, and sickle cell disease is fairly rare, um, uh, as you mentioned, tribal populations. One of the challenges, uh, are there are several other social determinants that would uh, influence the translation process um, and act as barriers. Um, this technology, what are some other applications that you see in the clinical realm for more prevalent conditions. Thank you. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. So sickle cell is not rare, actually. Fifty percent of the carriers from across the world are from India, and if you look at just the because we do this regularly now in different places, uh, talking to the ministry. So Ministry of Tribal Affairs is the funder. So we have the list of people who are affected by sickle. It's large. Um, last week we did a feluda, and in an Anganwari, one out of four were positive. So that's how the prevalent this is. But more importantly, they marry, right? And if the counseling is not done, then you have the, the next generation which is affected. So it's definitely not rare. Um, why sickle has got prominence for gene therapy or gene editing is because the, of the possibility of doing an ex vivo manipulation. Blood has got hematopoietic stem cells. If you can correct those cells and return, they engraft, and then it gives rise to next generation of corrected cells. The other diseases which we are also working towards trials is one is an eye, eye diseases because it's easy to deliver in the eye. It's immunologically a bit safer and also feasible. And uh, in some kind of sunshine-like trials which have just started to work on uh, where absolutely there is no, no other way to save the patient such as you know some neuropathies for example. Uh, these would be probably the first few, I think eye and blood disorders, maybe thalassemia and uh, hemophilia and so on, which would be the major, uh, major diseases. I think we'd go ahead here. Uh, thank you for the nice talk, sir. Yes. So actually my question was like, are you looking into germline corrections currently? No, I think there is an international moratorium on germline correction. So uh, beyond 14 days, and that too in some places of the world which has got, a, got an approval, you are not supposed to be doing any kind of editing experiment. And that's a pretty much accepted moratorium by all scientists across the world. 14 days of the embryo that I'm saying. Uh, answer like apart from sickle cell, because you have a platform technology that can detect SNPs. So like apart from sickle cell, you are also will be looking yeah at yeah yeah. So we have our uh, collaborations with AIMS, uh, with uh, Dr. Makaria for H. pylori, for example, with Dr. Kostav Sanyal at JNC for for fungus, and it's it's a platform technology. So you know it depends on what mutation that you are what you are interested in. It doesn't really discriminate between that disease or that uh, kind. So yeah so. Uh, based on the bandwidth that I have right now, just the ones which are which I have picked up are these are the ones, yeah. All right, thank you. So in interest of time, uh, sure. maybe we can move on. Uh, Dr. Devajyoti will be around, and I hope other attendees that have questions uh, could ask him during the breaks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I request Devajyoti.